and good morning everybody again. I hope hope you enjoyed uh, uh, worship so far. I, I pray that, uh, we're, I mean, I'm glad you're here and I hope that you've uh, felt loved and welcome this morning and you feel the presence of God. Uh, today we're resuming our series called Serving Like Jesus where we're uh, working our way through the Gospel of Mark that we started a few weeks ago and and um, we're looking at the life of Jesus. You know, the gospel's about the life of Jesus, his ministry and his crucifixion and resurrection. And, and uh, uh, as we look at the life of Jesus, I want us to learn how to live like him, to love like him. Well, you know, the motto of our church, to live and love like Jesus. And, and that means we serve like Jesus. And if you recall, uh, and if you've uh, followed along with us, if you've been with us in our previous sermons in, in Mark, uh, we left with Jesus having called a few of his disciples, and uh, they're following him, and, and uh, we're picking up in uh, verse 21 of Mark chapter 1 this morning, and uh, the title of the message today is Following Jesus, and uh, so last message was follow Jesus, and today is, is following Jesus, and so uh, it, it, it's, uh, we're going to take a, another step in this uh, relationship with the Lord. And uh, another short text today, little chunks at a time, but a, a good opportunity for us to learn more about how awesome and how great our Savior is. Follow along with me as we read from God's Word. Mark chapter 1, beginning at verse 21, we read, Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One, of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Then they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. This is the word of God. Let's pray together. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we do bow before you this morning. And Lord, we're grateful for the opportunity that we have just to take a, a brief uh, glance into the Gospel of Mark today as we read the inspired, your inspired word, Lord, your perfect word of truth. God, help us to see that truth, Lord, speak to us, show us what we need to see and hear today, Lord, uh, save souls, change lives, Lord, transform us and make us like Christ, it's in his name we pray, amen. Well, the other day, I stopped up at Weigel's up here in Sweetwater, uh, we've got one of those discount cards, you know, where you can get the gas a little cheaper, so that's, that we tend to frequent Weigel's, you know, and, and um, <clears throat> an account or whatever. I don't, I don't actually use a card anymore. I use an app. But anyway, but anyway, I stopped to get some fuel, and I, I, as I was fueling up, I noticed this large van, uh, a stall or two over, uh, and um, it, was a, it was a big passenger van. There's quite a few people around it, and, and they were all dressed very similarly, you know, sort of like a an old um, gospel choir or something, you know. Uh, they, they, the, the men had on these um, blue shirts. They were, weren't were quite baby blue. They were a little darker than baby blue with maybe a hint of a green, sort of an aqua. And I could tell immediately that uh, the, these shirts, although they, were, they looked very uh, well made, they were homemade. And, uh, and they all had the, the, both men that I saw, a man and probably a father and a son, had on black pants, and the man had a beard, you know, no mustache. 
And then I saw the ladies, they all had on exactly the same color of blue, dresses, you know, from here to the ankles. And, um, you know, there were several of them. And due to my immediate, or you know, my previous exposure, I, you know, knew that some, these people were probably some kind of Amish or Mennonite family. And, and um, but I was really surprised to see them fueling their ride with gasoline instead of a bell of hay. You know, and that, that, that perplexed me a little bit. But it did, it did uh, catch my interest. And, you know, that I, I know from history and reading and, you know, some of my religious studies that there are quite a few different uh, levels of uh, Mennonites and Amish and where they come from and, and that kind of thing. So it wasn't completely shocking, but it seemed a little bit out of kilter from what I normally see with people who dress like that around here. And, and, um, and so, um, you know, as you probably know, most Amish and Mennonites, they pretty much isolate themselves from society and they avoid modern technology and, and uh, modern conveniences and, and they uh, ascribe themselves to a certain uh, pattern of plain life, just simple uh, living uh, like you're stepping back in time, in a sense, to 150 years ago or even more. And, but, you know, and so I was really surprised to see this family fueling up and loading themselves into this late model, impressive uh, passenger van. You know, we, we would do well to have one just like it here at the church. But, but you know, if they hadn't had on the obviously Amish clothes, I wouldn't have given their identity a second glance. It wouldn't have, have uh, you know, surprised me at all. And the reason I'm telling you this is because sometimes, in, in a similar way, I'm equally surprised with things I see in the lives of people who say they're Christian. You know, uh, and Amish, I mean, they are Christian. They, 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 their faith really is not a, very different from Baptist, except for a lot of the ways that they they teach and live. But you know, but but sometimes I'm equally surprised to hear somebody say, "Oh yeah, I'm a Christian," because the things I see in their life don't seem to match uh, that designation. Same way with a, a Mennonite driving a gasoline van. Uh, and so, um, you know, the term Christian comes from uh, a designation that originally, you know, it, it means literally little Christ. And, and it was probably a derogatory term that a lot of the folks in the Roman Empire gave to Christians. Oh, look at those little Christ. They're trying to be like Jesus. That's right. That's exactly who we want to be like, right? And so uh, the Christians were like, hey, I, that's not a put down on me. I'm, I want to be like Jesus, and that's the way we ought to be. Uh, but if you claim to be a Christian, you know, the lifestyle you live and the choices you make should reveal the truth that you're following Jesus. And not, none of us are going to be perfect. We're going we're to slip up. We're going to have failures. There's going to be sin. But uh, when somebody looks at your life, they ought to be able to tell uh, that you're a Christian just as easy it is to tell when someone's an Amish or a Mennonite. And uh, today from our text, what I want to do is uh, take this short text that we read and I want to share with you three characteristics in the life of someone who's following Jesus. And, and if we're going to live like Jesus and love like Jesus and serve like Jesus and we want to be like Jesus, so these characteristics are characteristics of Jesus in this text. And, and that's what I want to share with you. And the first one's really this. Listen, and, and um, I, I hope you get this, but it's, it's a, a point here that we see that, that I think we need to emphasize, especially in our, in our climate today. But that is, if you are a Christian, you're going to live like Jesus. If you're going to be like Jesus, public worship must be a priority. Public worship is a priority to people who want to live like Jesus. It is, you know. Uh, <laughs> Jesus went to church, so to speak, didn't he? You know? I wonder what excuses Jesus came up with 
to not go to church. I started to put this out on social media to see what I came up with. Well, uh, you know, it's the only day off I've got during the week, you know. Would Jesus say that? No. Well, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, my, my stomach's bothering me a little bit today. And, you know, I stubbed my toe or I, I didn't get enough sleep last night. And, you know, we, we hear excuses and we, we see people make excuses a lot about reasons. And, well, hey, we've got this pandemic going on, you know. You're not supposed to gather together. Well, look, I mean, that, that's pretty much over. All right? Not the pandemic's over, but the forbidding together is over. Uh, but look at, look at the text. When Jesus called his disciples, this is the point I want you to see. It says, they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue in a talk. Now, the text says they went to Capernaum. First of all, Capernaum, uh, just a little, little lesson here if you don't know. It literally means the village of Nahum. Remember him? Uh, Nahum. And so that's where it gets its name. And uh, if you don't know where Capernaum is, if you, if, you, if you can picture the Dead Sea from north to south, it, I probably can't make it exactly right, but it's sort of a, a long lake. It's sort of top center, north center. And uh, it was a significant port city, a fisher, fisherman city. It was a, a, a day, in Jesus' day, it was a mixed population. There were a lot of Jews there. There were... Gentiles, there were Roman soldiers, there were public officials. It was just a, you know, sort of a, a mixture of people from all over the world in a way. It was a, a, a common place that people traveled through, sort of a border crossing area, the north part of the, the Sea of Galilee. And it, and it, was, it's a, it became a, a, a headquarters for Jesus' Galilean ministry. St. Peter's family lived there. And we'll see that, I think, as we move forward in our text probably next week that St. Peter's family lived there. And, and that's where Jesus appears that he stayed. It seems that's where he stayed when he was in Capernaum was he stayed in the house of Peter. And so it was sort of a headquarters for Jesus' ministry. But notice it was also the Sabbath. And he immediately went into the synagogue. And so I'm assuming that this is probably Friday evening. Uh, because the Jewish Sabbath begins at sundown on Friday evening and it goes through sundown on Saturday evening. And so that's the period because, you know, the Jews, uh, their day starts in the evening because the Bible, after all, when God created the day, said and the evening and the morning were the first day. And that's why. Uh, it's biblically based. But, but so the Jewish Sabbath starts on Friday at sundown, goes through Saturday evening. And, and uh, so we're not 100% sure when this was, but it says immediately Jesus went into the synagogue. And so I want you to understand this. I want you to know, and I hopefully you already know this, but Jesus made a habit of going to synagogue on the Sabbath. They had a couple other days that they met through the week. I think Thursday was one of those days, Tuesday. Uh, where they would gather, and I'm pretty sure he probably went on those days too. I can't imagine that he didn't. But for Jesus, the synagogue would have been similar to uh, a church building today. Uh, for us, in, in the age of the church, the synagogue was a building or a place where Jews gathered to read scripture, to pray, to uh, teach and learn from the word of God. You know, there, there was only one temple, and that was in Jerusalem, and everybody couldn't go to the temple all the time. And, and so especially after the Babylonian captivity, uh, when the Jews returned to the land, they started erecting synagogues, and it was expected for any place where 10 Jewish men lived, age 13 or older. So men, when you turn 13, boys, when you turn 13, you become a man. It's when you start acting like a man. But you can start acting like one now, all right? Close enough. Uh, but, but at 13 or older, any, 10 male Jews, they were expected to have a synagogue. And uh, sometimes it was just in a house, but most of the time they erected some kind of building or some kind of structure where that's where they would come together. They would study the Bible. They would pray. They would encourage one another. They had education, community gatherings. I want you to notice what Luke wrote in Luke chapter 4 and verse 16 in his gospel. He says, when Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, look what he says, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. That was his custom. That's, that's what Jesus did. And I wouldn't have expected anything else with you. Jesus is going to go to church when it's time to go to church, folks. 
You know, as his custom was. And he stood up to read. And if he's going to church, he's going to read the scriptures. And that was part of what Jews did. They, uh, folks come in, and if there was a rabbi or teacher, especially from another place, he'd come in, they'd give him an opportunity to read and to, and to expound on some scripture. And so naturally, Jesus prioritized public worship. You know, we need to prioritize public, pu uh, private worship. Every one of us need to have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to have that time in the Word. And we need to have our private prayer time. And we need to have our private worship time. But folks, just as much, we need public worship time. Public fellowship with other believers. We need that. And Jesus knew that. And that's why he gave us an example of that. And the synagogue was this, like I said, this place where they gathered and they prayed and they read scripture and they interpreted scripture and they interpreted God's truth and they applied that to their lives. Does that sound familiar? It sounds a lot like what we try to do as a church, doesn't it? It's, it's what we're trying to do. That's why we gather together. We pray together. We read God's word. We try to interpret God's word. We try to apply God's word. And we encourage one another. And we pray for one another. And we hold one another accountable. And we fellowship together. And, and all these things. And why do we do that? Because we want to live like Jesus. We want to love Jesus. And we want to love people like Jesus loves people. And so... You know, it's, it's common for people today who claim to be Christian and who are Christians, as a matter of fact, to skip public gathering for worship altogether. I've heard people say several times, well, you don't need to go to church to be a Christian. No, but if you are a Christian, you know what? You will want to go to church. You will want to be a part of a fellowship of believers. You will want to be involved with them, doing ministry and carrying out uh, the things that God's called you to do and exercising the gifts that God's give, given you to use. Um, you know, and this has just gotten worse over the last year or so, hasn't it? With the pandemic, people have excuse not to attend. You know, there's more isolation. And it's a dangerous precedent. To say it, and it's a spiritually destructive pattern to isolate yourselves from God's people. And that's why Jesus went to synagogue. He, he's exemplifying that to us, and he's teaching people, and he loves people, and, and, and we ought to see that in our lives as we follow Christ. A devoted Christ follower must prioritize public worship and participation with the family of faith. Prioritize public worship. You know, Haddon Robinson pointed out the significance of priorities. He, he ran across this uh, recipe for cooking rabbit. So, any of y'all hunters, you like to make rabbit? I'm gonna. I'm not. I don't have the full recipe, but I'm gonna give you the first step. All right? Because that's what he said. That he noticed about it was it started. This recipe for rabbit started with this obvious injunction. The first thing you have to do: catch a rabbit. That's the priority. Hard to cook a rabbit if you don't have a rabbit. <laughs> Hard to be a Christian if you don't go to church. That's, that's a priority. You follow that? I, I think that, though, that fits together. That, you know, we, we establish priorities. And if we're going to follow Jesus and live in love of like him, we must make public worship a priority. Another important characteristic of a life that's following Jesus, not only must you make public worship a priority, but God's word is shared with authority. When people are following Jesus, there's something inside of you that, that makes you want to share the word of God with other people. You want to share scripture. You want to you help people interpret scripture. You want people to allow God's word to penetrate their darkness and light them up. You know what I'm saying? And so uh, as we continue to read the text, look at verse 22. He, he says, and they were astonished at his teaching. Jesus stood up in the synagogue. He starts teaching, and they're astonished. For he taught as one having authority, not as the scribe. Now Mark doesn't really tell us what Jesus is teaching, like what passage or anything like that. Uh, but he, what he is sharing with us is that 
the way that Jesus taught or something about the teaching of Jesus was different from the teaching of the scribes, emphasizing the authority that Jesus taught with. And in verse 27, we see a little more detail with this. As, you know, he's, uh, they, they encounter this um, uh, demon-possessed man, and, and they're all amazed, and they question among themselves, and they're saying, what is this? What new doctrine is this? For he says, for, with authority he commands even unclean spirits, and they obey him. So we're seeing this astonishment. And the word astonished describes the reaction of all those who heard Jesus teaching. And, and, and basically it just means that they were blown away. You know, they hadn't heard anybody teach like Jesus. This was, this was a different kind of teaching. And um, they were taken back. And we know uh, because uh, that they're obviously comparing him to the scribes because of what, what they say in verse 22. He's, he's not teaching like the scribes. Well, well, how did the scribes teach? Well, the scribes were mainly made up of Pharisees and Sadducees. So they were religious men. They knew the scriptures, and they taught scripture, and they were highly respected. But obviously, we see here their teaching wasn't like the teaching of Jesus. Their teaching, the reason their teaching was different is because their teaching got their its authority from elders and scribes and rabbis who had come before them. You see, they had gotten this habit of where instead of really teaching the scriptures, they were teaching the commentary. You see, they, they were teaching what other rabbis had taught, and, they're, and, and they got in the habit of saying, oh, rabbi so-and-so, this is what he says. Instead of saying, hey, this is what the word God says. And uh, that, that's kind of what had happened. And, and we know that because when we get to Mark chapter 7, we're going to look at just one verse here. And we can put it in context later when we go through it. But this is Jesus addressing that with some of these Pharisees and scribes. He says, you're making the word of God of no effect. See that? You're making the word of God of no effect. How? Through your tradition which you've handed down. And many of the things that you do. You know, the way you live your lives and what you're teaching, you're making the word of God weak. So maybe that helps you understand why these folks are saying, hey, uh, Jesus teaches different because he's teaching with authority. Because he's not saying, hey, old rabbi so-and-so over here says this. He's saying something different. And I mean, think about it. By, 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 by teaching from tradition instead of scripture, these scribes diminished the authority of the word of God. And what sounds with more authority? Thus says Rabbi Hashim, or thus saith the Lord. I think the answer is pretty obvious, isn't it? Uh, what the Lord says carries much more authority. And that was the focus of Jesus' teaching. When Jesus is teaching, he's not, he's not worried about what some rabbi taught before him. He's going straight to the word of God. He's expanding the word of God, and he's revealing the truth of the word of God to them. And, uh, you know, Jesus, likely he was uh, teaching messianic prophecies. He was pointing out that he was the fulfillment of these prophecies, and and it was a new doctrine for many of them. That's why in verse 27 we show, you know, listen, what kind of new doctrine is this? And, and it is probably because they weren't familiar with this teaching. You know, they, they, weren't, they weren't looking, most of them weren't looking for a Messiah like Jesus. You know, they, they, they had misunderstood, a lot of them had misunderstood uh, a lot of that teaching. And, and um, his authority, Jesus' authority was outstanding because he was in fact, the Son of God, and, and it's His Word. He, he, he is the Word. The Bible teaches us that the Word became flesh. And so it's His Word, and His Word has authority. And I want you to understand that God's Word has authority. And when we just present God's Word, God's Word works in the hearts and lives of people. And so when you're, confront, when you're confronting people, when you're talking with people, share Scripture with people. You know, of course, they may want to hear your stories. They might want to hear about some of the fun stuff that, that the youth do here or what a good time they're having in the children's ministry or, you know, or, and, I, and those kind of things. You may even want to tell them how great a preacher I am. But don't worry about none of that stuff. You tell them, you give them the Word of God because the Word of God has authority and the Word of God releases the Spirit of God which brings conviction 
and sorrow and repentance and faith. And these scribes, they had, or these folks in the, in the synagogue, they hadn't seen that kind of stuff. What is this? And so we're, the word of God has authority. And you just, you just speak it. You just read it. You just share it. It's amazing what God does through his holy word. And I believe a person who follows Jesus, that they understand that. And they don't just speak in parables. They share the word of God with people who need to hear the word of God. When, Christ, when Christian Herder was the governor of Massachusetts, he was running hard for a second term in office. And one day, after a busy morning chasing boats and no lunch, he arrived at a church barbecue. It was late afternoon and he said he was famished. He was starving to death. He moved down the serving line. He held out his plate to the woman serving the chicken. And she put a piece on his plate. And, and then she turned to the next person in line. Governor Herder said, excuse me. He said, do you mind if I have another piece of chicken? And the lady said, sorry. I'm only supposed to give one piece of chicken to each person. He said, but I'm starved. And she says, I'm sorry, only one, one per person. And Governor Herder, he was modest and unassuming man, but, but he decided this time he was going to throw his weight around a little bit. You know. And he just asked the lady, he said, do you know who I am? <laughs> he said, I'm the governor of this state. And the woman replied sternly, says, do you know who I am? I'm the lady in charge of the chicken. Move on. <laughs> oh man and so you see when you are in a lunch line the lunch line lady has all the authority you know and, and, but when you are in a lifeline God's word has all the authority I want you to understand that folks when you follow Jesus when you preach and teach and explain and apply the word of God you do so with unmatched authority because God's word has authority. You know, we live in a generation that wants to manipulate the word of God. It wants to pervert the word of God and it wants to soften uh, what the word of God says about this sin and that sin. My folks want to tear out pages from their Bible and say, oh, that doesn't fit and that doesn't fit and they or cut out passages and they got holes in their Bibles, or they want to reinterpret a passage. I was reading yesterday about some folks saying that a, a, a particular word didn't appear in the Bible until 1946, and, and I, I'm reading that. And I'm, this is hogwash. It's pure hogwash. Y'all know what that is? I mean, it, it, it carries no value. The Word of God has been the Word of God since it's been the Word of God. You know, it does not change. It, it, and, and folks, we need to understand that. Uh, you know, I want to tell you, God's Word says what it says. And, and uh, people need to understand it. And if we're going to live like Jesus, we must be willing to share the Word of God without compromising its truth, without softening its truth, and instead of ex uh, accepting uh, or, or instead of twerking God's word, we need to accept God's word. And, and, and we, we need to make it sound like it says what, instead of making it sound like it says what we wish it said, we just need to let it say what it says. When you read the word of God, a lot of times, folks will, try to say, oh, this passage says this or this passage says that. But you know, if you just read it plainly, let it say what it says plainly. You know? Because that's what it says. And it, 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 God gave it to us in a way where we all can read it. We all can understand it. We must let God's word say what it says. And instead of trying to adjust his word to our truth, we need to let his word adjust us to his truth. And when we follow Jesus, that's what we do. Isn't it? God's word's the authority. We do what, he's, what it says. 
And if you're going to live and love like Jesus, we've got to serve the word of God straight. And we share God's word with authority. Don't worry about offending anybody because, hey, I didn't say it. God said it. If you've got a problem, it's not with me. It's with him. And we need to understand that. And, and that can only be done when we share God's word without compromising. So uh, it's, for those who are following Jesus, Public worship's a priority. <laughs> God's word is authority. We need to share it that way. And one other characteristic of a life that follows Jesus that I want to share with you this morning, that's this. God's power over evil is displayed in a life that follows Jesus. <clears throat> we obviously see that in Jesus' life. So if, we, if he's indwelling us and we're living like him, it ought to show up in our life. Power over evil, over temptation, over uh, uh, all those evil things that would try to destroy us. And in this passage, you know, we understand we serve a mighty God. He has power over all creation. His authority will not be usurped. There's coming a day, you can read about it in Revelation chapter 20, where every demon will be destroyed and will be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone forever and ever. Preacher, do you believe that? Yes, I do. I believe it. Do you believe this, this stuff about demons uh, uh, possessing people like this past time? Yes, I do. Uh, the Bible says it. The Bible's the authority. So I believe it. It says in verse 23, we see a situation with an unclean spirit that indwelled a man in the synagogue. And then what we're talking about here is a demon-possessed person. That's the plainest way to say it today. And, uh, you know, he says that he cried out. Now, demons most likely are possessed by these fallen angels that we read about in Isaiah and other places in Scripture. So here's a, a, a in all, of all places, <laughs> in the gathering of God's people, a man possessed by a demon. Think it happens in our churches? Yeah, I'm pretty sure I've seen it. I'm pretty sure I've seen it. And, and uh, you know, but in a house of worship, don't miss the significance of this, you know. Notice the response of this demon, though. This, this is where we don't need to, there's great, great insight here. Look what the demon says. Let us alone. What have we to do with you? Jesus of Nazareth. You catch that? He knows who Jesus is. He knows where Jesus is from, the human, the man Jesus. The Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, do you come to destroy us? Now we understand he knows the power of Jesus. He probably knows his future predicament with Jesus. And he thinks it's time. And then he says, I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. He recognizes the deity of Jesus. And so he recognizes Jesus in terms of his humanity and his deity. Us probably, you know, it may mean that there's multiple demons that have possessed him, or it may just refer to the whole realm of demons in general, or, or, or maybe even something different. But, but um, he recognizes that Jesus is a threat to who he is and what he's doing. This demon does. And he realizes that Jesus has the power and authority to destroy him. And he recognizes who Jesus is. And this is not the only time in Scripture, almost every time, demons recognize that Jesus is the Holy One of God. Have you ever noticed that? These demons, they know who he is. But guess what? The scribes didn't, didn't they? Those in the house, of, they hadn't recognized it yet, but this demon knew. He knew immediately. They recognized the deity of Christ. But now notice Jesus' response to the demons. But Jesus rebuked him saying, be quiet and come out of him. And immediately Jesus rebuked him. He says, be silent. It's basically the same phrase where Jesus is on, on a ship and he, he says, peace be still. He says, calm down. Be quiet. <laughs> he can do that with demons. He can do it with winds and waves. It doesn't matter. It's all the same to him. That's the power of our God. But it's an imperative. It's a command. He's basically saying, shut up and come out of that man. 
Just a few direct words from absolute authority. There's no spell. There's no incantation. There are no rosary beads or holy water. None of that stuff is present. Just the word of the living God. Be quiet and come out of him. That's the power of Jesus. Notice verse 26. It says, And then when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out. So apparently this, this evil spirit did everything he could as, as he came out of this, he didn't have any choice. He, di he didn't come out willingly. He come out because he had to. He didn't obey out of obedience, not because he wanted to, because he had to. And so he convulsed him and he cried out. And so, you know, he, he shook the man or something. Well, you know, he didn't want to leave the man without trying to do some damage, I guess. But, but the one who has power and authority over him made him come out. And he came out. And of course then we see that all were amazed at the power and authority of Jesus and his word. In verse 27, they're all amazed. I already read it once, but he says, and they question among themselves, and what is this new doctrine with authority? He commands the unclean spirits and they come out. In verse 27. Jesus has power over the evil in this world. He defeated sin, death, and grave on the cross. And through us, in his power through us, we have the same power. You know, um, on New Year's Day several years ago in the Tournament of Roses Parade, there was a beautiful float that, that suddenly sputtered and it quit, you know. And it, it was out of gas. The, the whole parade was held up until someone could run and get a can of gas. And the funny thing about it was this float represented the Standard Oil Company. With all of its vast oil resources, its truck was out of gas. <laughs> Ain't that something? <laughs> that ought to say something to us, you know? <laughs> but, you know, the thing about it is, a lot of times as Christians, you know, we don't fill, get our tanks filled up. We run out of gas. We give up, and, and that's when evil takes over. That's when, when things happen. Now, now I, I don't believe a person who's filled with the Spirit of God can be possessed by a demon. I believe that's for lost people. Uh, I believe we could look at that scripture and we could show you that. We don't have time right now, but, but, but a lot of times, you know, we, because of sin and disobedience, uh, we quench the Spirit of God in our life. We water down the gas, so to speak. And we, we have trouble getting started and moving on ourselves. And I hope you understand that, that our God has power over all the realm of his creation and evil will be conquered by him. And we need to operate our lives with that understanding as we follow the ruler and supreme power of the universe. As we follow Jesus. And when you, when you walk with him and he's in you, you're given power over the evil in this world. And you... And I believe a person who's following Jesus, their lives will demonstrate victory over evil. Do you see that? They will. You have the power to resist temptation and defeat evil in your life. Don't ever forget that. When you have Jesus, you've got that. You know, last week we, we were at Disney World and Christy had us scheduled the different days at different parks. And every day we'd walk in and be like, all right, well, let's get our plan. Where are we going first? Where are we eating? When are we eating? You know, we, we try, you know, you can walk yourself to death in a place like that. And, I mean, we, it felt like we came close. But, uh, but, but, you know, we tried to plan everything out. And, you know, it was all around food and fun and, um, you know, seeing what we wanted to see and riding what we wanted to ride and eating where we had planned to eat. And it took us to places where sometimes we were able to walk up and immediately walk in or get on a ride and enjoy it, and before you knew it, it was over. And then there were other times it took forever to get where we wanted to go, and then we didn't get to even go on what we wanted to go in in the first place. Now, that's frustrating. <laughs> you know, but life deals us 
the same types of experiences a lot of times. You know, we, but just like we followed a plan for the day at Disney World, we must follow Jesus' plan for our lives and go where he says go. And sometimes it's going to be fun. Sometimes it's going to be tough. And sometimes we're going to wind up where we didn't even plan on going in the first place. But when we're doing these things, we got to remember there's these three important characteristics of following Jesus. I believe they're important, and I believe they're here for a reason, and I hope you can see them as clearly as I do. Public worship is a priority for a follower of Jesus. God's Word, spoken with authority, is a priority for a follower of Jesus. And a demonstration of of power over evil in your life is important for a follower of Jesus. And that comes when you have a relationship with Jesus and you're following Jesus patiently. You know, nobody wins by repeating a prayer and getting dunked and going back to the life they always lived. That's not a Christian. A Christian, somebody who says, you know what, I'm not going this way anymore. I'm going with Jesus. And even so, though sometimes it may, you may seem like you're off the path, when you're following Jesus and you love Jesus, your mind's always like, oh man, i got to get back to Jesus. And that's where you go. When you follow Jesus. That's genuine. That's genuine. That, that's where it makes a difference. And it'll show up with these characteristics in your life. And so, oh man, you know, um, that, that, you know that, when you do those things, that's when you'll experience victory. There is sweet victory in Jesus. And that's what we see in, in verse 26 from those in Capernaum in the synagogue. Excuse me, in verse 28 it says, And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region of Galilee. <laughs> You see, when, when, when Jesus is doing his thing, and even when he's doing it through our lives, people, people notice. And his name's glorified. And people come, and they want to know more about Jesus. And that's what we want, isn't it? We want people to know about Jesus. The name of Jesus is glorified and honored when we follow him. And I just want to ask you this morning, will you follow Jesus today? Will you turn to him in faith? Will you turn back to him? Some of you, maybe you're watching online, maybe, maybe you're up watching later, maybe you're here, but some of you have uh, wandered away from Christ and you've not been following Jesus, you've not been living a, a Christian life, but today you hear the call of Jesus. Come on, child. It's time to come back. It's time to get in step. It's time to make things right. I'm urging you today, follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. Let these things be true in your life. Will you come this morning as we as we sing? Let's pray together and let's respond in faith today. Father, we do bow before you this morning. We're thankful for your word. God, we pray today that uh, these characteristics will resonate in our lives and our hearts. Lord, help us. Lord, save souls. Lord, change lives. Help us to follow you passionately, faithfully, courageously, so that others might see you and might know you and follow you with us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. God's speaking to your heart and life. Now's the time to respond. We want to urge you to come on, step out. Let's pray. Let's see Christ together. Come on, as we sing.